I've read um, uh, a great deal of Moshe Halbertal's work um, over the years. I told him just a moment ago that actually I taught one of his books, uh, the uh, book on idolatry that he wrote with Avishai Margalit in one of my graduate seminars. And I've been reading the extraordinarily fine website that Ragita Dirgam ha has for herself, and I really encourage you to look at it uh, to see some extraordinary writing um, on the Middle East today. Uh, and it's real simple, I think. It's just ragitadirgam.com. Uh, uh, and so you can find it yourself there um, and be introduced very quickly to some very important issues. Um, my basic task here is to tell you how we're going to work this this afternoon because this is a dialogue. It is a discussion uh, that we get to learn from. And so we're going to start out in just a moment with Ragita um, speaking for approximately 15 minutes. And that will be followed by Moshe speaking for uh, approximately 15 minutes. Then um, um, each of them will join me seated um, together and we'll have approximately 10 minutes apiece to respond to the issues and points that one another made in the initial presentation. And then um, I hope at that point that you've taken some of these cards and pencils that we distributed and um, I'm going to ask you um, to write your questions down and then to pass them to the aisles for our student uh, our students to, uh, to pick up and to give to me. And what my task will be is to try to cull th those um, cards and questions and pick out the ones that I think, and you'll have to rely on me, I'm sorry. Um, you just have to rely on my ability to find the best questions. And of course, I know I may not find everyone's question, um, uh, but uh, we'll have a little bit of time at the end, perhaps, for you to introduce yourself and perhaps ask a question after we're finished today um, of our, our speakers. So, without any further ado, please let me now invite Ragita Dirgam uh, to join us at the podium. I very much appreciate the subject we're going to, we'll be talking about. I appreciate the choice of the subject, which is achieving a two-state solution. Uh, it is essential and important and actually detrimental for the region and the world, in effect, because of what I'm, I'm going to tell you the reasons later, that this two-state solution is achieved. And I am so scared that in the absence of such a two-state solution, uh, the situation would be rather dire for the region and beyond. Starting with this, let me address, I'll start on the positive note and try to uh, sort of raise with you what are the encouraging signs, the positive signs that should make us believe that a two-state solution is achievable. Um, we have an international consensus and this international consensus is on the clear parameters of the two-state solution. We have a quartet, which is, as you know, this is the uh, United States, United Nations, uh, Russia, and the European uh, Union. These four partners have decided to be partners in trying to help both uh, Palestinians and Israelis, the Arabs and the Israelis, to achieve uh, a solution to the Arab-Israeli conflict. And the clear consensus uh, uh, is on the clear parameters of what would bring about such a solution. Secondly, we have an American president who is not only intent on finding a solution to this problem, but a president who is willing to take the heat to forge such a settlement. The administration is speaking in, of a new language, but more importantly, the military in the United States are speaking the language of solving this problem as a matter that is in our national security, national interest of the United States. And I, when I say ours, I, I want to mention to those who don't know my background, 
I do come from Lebanon, but I'm an American citizen, and uh, my grandparents actually met and married here, so technically I'm a third generation American. <laughs> But, uh, so forget about the accent, and, and, and when you imagine me being an American uh, of a third generation, but, I, I, and I think it's essential that we hear now that, that resolving the Arab-Israeli issue, the Palestinian-Israeli issue, is in the American national interest, and not resolving it threatens the American security national interest. Thirdly, we have a one-year frame, a de facto one-year frame, practically for the materialization of the two-state solution. That is, if things are going well, that is, if the negotiations are continuing. Um, and that is because of several reasons. You have uh, President Obama, when he was in the, Security, in the General Assembly of the United Nations just a couple of weeks ago, he did speak about a year, hoping that there will be a Palestinian state that is a member of the uh, international community of the United Nations. Uh, uh, there is, a, there is a, a measurements or measures taking on, taking shape on the ground for uh, building the institutions of the state of Palestine. There is also uh, a very narrow, uh, uh, if you will, uh, space for patience. If we do not accomplish this maximum by one year, I think you could just say goodbye to the two-state solution and bid it farewell forever. Uh, there's also an Arab Peace Initiative. This Arab Peace Initiative, I'm very surprised that many people just don't, have not even read it, and I really think the media have not played their role into bringing about the details and the value of this Arab Peace Initiative. For those who have not read it, I advise you to read it, because it recognizes Israel's right to exist and offers coexistence with Israel and readiness to, you know, to spell out all the details of a peaceful coexistence. Not only that, there is a readiness by about 50 Muslim states, Muslim countries, who would offer recognition and normalization with Israel if it signs to the two-state solution that would end occupation along the 1967 borders. So there is a clarity on an Arab peace initiative that speaks of recognizing Israel, and I think this has not been spelled out, nor has there been enough familiarity by people in the United States with this initiative. We have a Palestinian president, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, who adheres to negotiations as, as his strategic choice, despite all the difficulties and the setbacks, including the continued settlements activities that go on uh, by Israel, uh, you know, ignoring international appeals, uh, American uh, appeals, and saying stop it because they are to begin with illegal settlements and they are hindering the peace process. We also have a Palestinian prime minister who is heavily engaged, as I said, in institution building to the extent that the World Bank said that the Palestinians could, in fact, they are ready, I have the quote somewhere here, but they said that Palestinians are ready to have their state in, in see reality uh, if they go on. It says, the, this, it's a testimony really, it said, if the Palestinian Authority maintains its current performance in institution building and delivery of public services, it is well positioned for the establishment of a state at any point in the near future. I think that is a very important testimony for the work that's being done in building the institutions of a Palestinian state. Also, uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, Salam Fayyad, who is behind this effort, he uh, has launched, I mean, he had said, give me two years and I will get ready the institutions for a Palestinian state. One year has already passed, and then he, this, this time, uh, he, you know, like in the anniversary of one year to go, he announced something that he dubbed as the home stretch to freedom, and he uh, launched a widened program over the priorities uh, of what remains in the program to complete building state institutions. We also have an Israeli prime minister who says he wants a two-state solution and who may want to make history for himself by delivering on the two-state solution. We have a public opinion that is worldwide, actually, and it's ready to see the solution of this conflict, and we lack brave politicians, but, you know, in, in, in effect, if we do have an active uh, a public opinion that pushes uh, its politicians, including in the United States, mind you. I don't mean only in the region. I mean, I think it behooves us in the United States to talk to our senators. Your own senator, Barbara Boxer, has been sitting on the, uh, inter uh, on, uh, the Foreign Relations Committee for 28 years, I think. I think it will be important to push with her that, that supporting Israel 
does not mean that you give a blanket support to Israel, but in fact, help Israel conclude a two-state uh, uh, solution because it is in the interest of Israel. So I think it is very important to push our own politicians rather than just take for granted that we only want them to have a blanket and blind support to really get active in rescuing this two-state solution. The logic of the two-state solution is so compelling, one would think that it's impossible to allow the evolution of other alternatives to prevail, particularly from the Israeli side. And I think that resolving the Palestinian issue would take away the pretexts from those who hijack the issue of Palestine for their own agenda and for their own design. Specifically, there are Islamic extremists who do so. Consequently, if you want to win half the battle against extremism, at least half, not full, because it's not only about the Palestinian-Israeli issue, but at least you could do that half. Take care of the Palestinian-Israeli issue, and half of the battle is won. And there are other battles to be won against extremists, but you know you really need to start to take to resolve this issue and take away the pretexts. Um, that what would happen is that Americans would not, if we do have the two-state solution and we resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict, Americans themselves would no longer be targeted as an enemy. Uh, that is because of the perceived blanket support uh, for, for Israel. So no matter what wrong Israel does, it is perceived that the United States will always just go ahead and support Israel. And I think Americans are paying a price for that. And there are plenty of, politi of, of policies that Israel executes that are in, against American laws, human rights laws, and humanitarian laws, and yet they go absolutely uh, uh, absolved. And that has been costing us our own credibility. Um, and then what would happen if we do have a two-state solution? Israelis would, not, would no longer live in, in a sort of a siege or a siege mentality. Instead, they would really live in normality, a normality that the Israelis deserve and they have not had in the past. I think a two-state solution will give that normality. Now, this is for the good side and hopefully for the positive uh, developments that would lead to a two-state solution. But what are the consequences if we do not have a two-state solution? Instead, Israel, uh, if, if, if Israel fails to grab, and I say grabbing this opportunity. If I were an Israeli, I would grab it. And what is being offered, as you all know, it's a solution, a two-state solution along the 67 borders with a limited land swap. Uh, and then if we fail, if the world fail, if Israel fail, fails, if the Arabs fail, if we all fail at this two-state solution. What I'm afraid of is that this conflict would be exacerbated as a national conflict and would expand dangerously to become a religi religious conflict. That is to say, it will be an all-out war between Muslims and Jews worldwide, not only an Israeli-Palestinian conflict over land. And that is something to contemplate, I think, Moshe, uh, has, uh, uh, and I agree uh, that we, we share this fear because that came out earlier in the, in the discussion, but I'm sure we'll get to talk about that a little more in, in the Q&A. The worst would be yet to come. Uh, just take a look at the situation, take a look at the numbers, and just imagine that we have a global religious conflict. If you think the national uh, conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis is bad enough, just stretch your imagination and think of this as a religious conflict worldwide. Um, what is stunning, and I want to be very clear about this, it's stunning to me is what's going on in Israel, sometimes in a straightforward open discussion or through a slip by certain politicians, as well as what is shaping up that could become an alternative policy for Israel. And I pray this will never happen, particularly because I heard and know of Israelis who will oppose it, and I hope they will oppose what I am going to, the fear I'm going to be expressing now. I'm talking about the pronounced policy by some members of the current government of Israel that they're speaking of uh, Israel as an exclusive national Jewish state, that it is only, uh, that it would be a, it's a state for purely for Jews, Israel as a purely Jewish state, Israel as only purely for Jews. What that means is that something must be done about the one and a half million Palestinians known as the Arabs of Israel who have lived in that land way before Israel ever came into existence. In other words, Israelis, those Israelis are talking about purifying Israel of non-Jews. 
Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman uh, spoke of an arranged population displacement whereby the indigenous Palestinian inhabitants of that land of where in Israel now would be uprooted from their homes so that Israel is a pure Jewish state. In return, some illegal settlers in the Palestinian territories would make the swap according to Avigdor Lieberman. Bluntly speaking, Israel is considering resolving its demographic problem through either organized displacement of the Palestinians in Israel or through mass expulsion, and that would require a major war. Such a war would have consequences way beyond Israel and the region. To begin with, Israelis and Jews worldwide would never live in peace, quite honestly, no matter how much ethnic cleansing took care of the demographic problem of Israel as a Jewish state. Secondly, the United States and Americans would not be spared because the U.S. is considered the essential backer of Israel, whatever Israel does. Thirdly, a terrible militant genie would be out of the bottle in the Arab and Muslim world. Moderation would be buried forever. Already, many Arabs and Muslims, many Arab and Muslim voices, are demanding of the Palestinian leadership to put an end to what they call this charade of negotiations while Israel goes on building illegal settlements on what would become the Palestinian state should the negotiations proceed to a two-state solution. Not to mention the Israeli cabinet's latest bill requiring new non-Jewish citizens to swear an oath of allegiance to Israel as a Jewish and, demo and, and, as, as a Jewish and democratic state in a move that has brought accusations of discrimination against Israel's Arab minority. One descending cabinet minister referred to a whiff of fascism, to use his words, according to The Guardian. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas opposes another armed intifada. He opposes another militarized intifada. I know so because he said that to me on the record. I interviewed him and he says that on the record. But beware. He does not hold the key to the Palestinians inside Israel, nor is it sure he can stay in control if the Israeli actions keep on undermining him and eroding his credibility in the eyes of his own people. Israel might want to invite the militants to a provocation or might incite a militant reaction deliberately in order to justify an all-out mass expulsion for those who want that sort of outcome. It is important to note that no operations, mind you, have, launched, have been launched against Israel recently by the militants in, uh, in Gaza. Even Hamas has uh, uh, curbed its, the, the other militant factions and so that they would not send rockets into Israel like they used to in the past. And, um, and even Hamas, interestingly, I think this is only to undermine the Palestinian Authority. I don't trust them in that. But they're speaking the language of accepting a two-state solution, and they uh, have refrained from uh, terrorist attacks, maybe because they want to sort of undermine the Palestinian Authority, and they say, you know, we can speak that language too. Um, Palestinians are considering alternatives, I want you to know. One such alternative is to rally further international support in the Security Council of the United Nations to adopt a simple resolution defining the contours of a Palestinian state in accordance with the international consensus that will be the borders that, that, that I said are known and it's the consensus of everybody along the 67 borders. It really, from my point of view, it behooves the United States to support such a resolution because both Republican and Democratic presidents spoke openly of the vision of a Palestinian state within the borders of where occupation ends. Otherwise, otherwise there is the option of begging out of moderation and of begging out of negotiation. In other words, there will be a freeze of negotiations. Moderates will step out as a buffer zone, protecting Israel from militancy and incitement or otherwise, and the peace process will be exposed and will come to an end. Another alternative that's being considered, and you know, again, the, the, I mean, I like the alternative of the Security Council, uh, and I like, I, I, I mean, I would tolerate the alternative of begging out of negotiations, but some are speaking even of willingly dissolving the Palestinian Authority so that Israel will bear the responsibility and the burden of full occupation of Palestinian territories. Think about that. The Palestinian Authority would not be in charge of relieving Israel from the outbreak of militancy or an armed intifada. Just think about this. 
Some are considering that option and that alternative. This is thought to be one potential answer to what is being perceived as Israel's plans for ethnic cleansing, or it could be a preemptive action for such, uh, 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 for such an outcome. All this, all this needs not happen if the Israelis take seriously and are genuine in the pursuit of a fair two-state solution. It is not up to the politicians alone. In fact, the public opinion has opted out of the responsibility. And I, this is, I want to emphasize that really it's about time for the public opinion to uphold its responsibility again. It is time to change that before it is too late. Lastly, the American Jewish leadership needs to take a fresh look at where we are. Blind backing of Israel without accountability is the worst thing for the future of Israel. The stifling of the debate does not service either, does no service. The stifling of the debate does no service either to Israel or to American national interests worldwide. I want to thank the sponsors of this forum, not only for the opportunity they have given me, but also for their leadership in changing the course of the debate and pushing forward the two-state solution. Let us hope that the voices of reason and moderation prevail there is no reason why we could not live together with mutual respect and in normalization. Thank you very much. I'm talking to you as, a, as an Israeli uh, who, not representing my government, representing, I think, a serious segment in Israel, And I want to describe the experience that I have as an Israeli in this issue of moving towards a two-state solution. So let me start with the following point. I, I am for a two-state solution, not only for the sake of the Palestinians who deserve a state of their own, but for the sake of Israel. I think it's a very important thing for us, us who have come to fulfill the legitimate right of self-determination of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. It's very important for us to recognize the same right that other inhabitants of this land have. It's also very important for our future not to be cornered into a situation in which, if God forbid, we will not achieve the division of the land. If God forbid, we'll end up a minority of Jews controlling a majority of Palestinians. And that would not be anymore a Jewish democratic state that we dream of. And this is why, in principle, strategically, spiritually, Jewishly, Zionistically, a two-state solution is crucial for us. Now, I also believe that if we look at the situation, there is no other solution. There is no one-state solution. Now, let's be clear about it, as far as I see it. What we have in this small, tortured land is two strong national movements that each deserves a fulfillment of its own right of self-determination. It's not going to work in one state. We have an experience north of us of a binational state called Lebanon. It's not a pretty experience. And there, by the way, all the factions talk Arabic. It's not true about Israel. Those who think about a one-state solution will end up actually either in a Jewish minority controlling an Arab majority or in the Jews being a minority in what is or what ought to be a democratic state but would not be a democratic state. It will be actually the worst exile for Jews. Two-state solution is the only option we have in the table. Now, when I look at the publics, when I look at the publics, the two publics, the Palestinians and us, I would say the following. 
60% of all of the public in those two sides believe in a two-state solution. You have, by the way, a record, a straight record of, of ongoing public opinion polls that show it. Israelis, most of Israelis do not want to occupy the Palestinians. Most Palestinians want a state of their own and they understand they're not going to throw the Israelis to the sea. They want a two-state solution. There is a stable majority, but and this is something very interesting. 80% of those 60% don't believe that there are 60% on the other side. <laughs> and now the question is, how did that happen and how we can change that? How did it happen? How is it that I think a good, a strong, good willing majority of both nations is not capable of doing it? And I want to start with a few comments about the history of it. And we are coming to that moment in our history, attempting to achieve a, a two-state solution after a long process of negotiation starting at the 90s with the Oslo Agreement. And what happened there? We look carefully at that agreement. You got Yitzhak Rabin, Zichon Oliver had the late Yitzhak Rabin, Arafat, Yasser Arafat, the chairman of Palestinian people, the president, trying to get a, an agreement between them. And meanwhile, meanwhile, they left the radicals to define what's going on. Israelis, I'm not talking about the experience of Israelis like myself, who was always voted for two-state solutions. We didn't understand if this is a peace agreement, why are buses exploding all over the country? What sort of a peace is that when Hamas terrorists are just exploding themselves all over? And it wasn't clear whether the other side is complicit with that, or the other side doesn't control it. Either of these two is very bad for the peace process. Then, some Israelis, by the way, there was a shift in Israel towards a two-state solution. Even Netanyahu now talks about two-state solution. Said, okay. Let's do a unilateral withdrawal because somehow we couldn't get an agreement. Camp David process failed. And Israel has done a unilateral withdrawal from Gaza and unilateral withdrawal from South Lebanon. And those two empty spaces were filled with radical Islamic movements, Hamas and Hezbollah. That by the way, they are not for a two-state solution. On the other end, the Palestinian side, what did the Palestinians saw is ongoing settlement activity, hardening of their lives on a daily basis, roadblocks, more, and they ask themselves, is this a peace process? Is this a peace process? And slowly, the most important aspect, with all public opinion and agreements, etc., the most important asset that you have in such condition is a minimum amount of trust. And that trust eroded. And it eroded, if I want to be honest about it, it eroded for the following reason. Both parties, both parties, weren't willing to take the harsh steps towards their radicals and not only that, they have used the radicals as leverage on the other side. And I remember looking at, you know, looking at the Palestinian Authority and kind of closing and opening the faucet of terror as if 
this is good for the negotiations, and at the end, you end up riding on a tiger you don't control. And we did the same thing with our own radicals. And you eroded the most important element of the possibility of trust. So if we look forward, if we are committed to the only reasonable, humanistic, serious, politically visible solution, it will be first and foremost that the good willing people of both sides will say, though we have differences between us, and we have, you want this, you know, it's a very complicated real estate deal. Remember Yossi Balin showed me his plan for the, for the Temple Mount for, for Haram El Sharif. So what do you think about it? I said, Yossi? This is the most complicated real estate deal I ever read in my life. <laughs> the Jordan, the, the dens will be in this side, this will take this, that, that. I said, that's not the issue. Trust. And the trust is for the following thing. We are going to put aside the minor differences that we have between us. I'm talking about the good willing people. And we will say we're together, going to stick together to not to let the extreme define the mood and the, and the public opinion and undermine every bit of trust that is left. It's crucial. And we both failed in that. And you have a situation today where many Israelis who supported two-state solution come to you and say, and if we are going to leave the West Bank, which that's what you want and that's what they deserve, can you assure us Hamas will not take over and then shoot missiles at our airport and Tel Aviv and this and that and that? This is a serious concern. And it's a concern of serious people. On the other hand, the Palestinians have serious concerns. And they have their own pain and problem. So I'm calling you, I'm calling us. What I believe is a good willing force to stand up together and control the ways in which the radicals have defined the terms of the conflict. You know, Oslo Agreement was a very interesting agreement. It started without defining what will be the end. Bad thing. And not only that, 60% of the people made an agreement with the other 60%, not defining where they're going and the hope they're building, the trust they're building, letting the other 40% disturb the process all the time. And not only that, using those 40% against one another. And it, it looked like a divorce agreement that the side decided to fight about each furniture, each piece of furniture alone. Bad agreement. But there is a different, there is a different, I think, deeper issue than trust. We have to build trust. We have to restore trust. And by restoring trust mean let's take seriously, seriously the concerns of each side. The Israeli concerns for security, the Palestinian concerns for dignity, for independence. It can be worked out. And we should know that while we're negotiating that, not taking care of radicals, it's playing with fire. It will be instruments that will control us at the end and will bring us all down. But we are still there and we can do it. But there is a different, I think, deeper issue besides trust. I don't think we can achieve a just peace. You know, the philosopher John Rawls says, justice is the main, <coughs> is the ground of political institutions. That's not always the, the case. Insisting on justice means also not getting peace. Because both parties would not get what from their own opinion they justly deserve. But we can get to a reconciliation. And let me, you know, share with you what it could look like 
Let me say we need Mandela. We need generosity that we don't have. How it would look like? We come to the Palestinians and say to them, look, you're going to get your own state, but you wouldn't get everything you, deserve, you think you deserve or you dream, which is you're not going to get the return of the refugees to their own homes. In Israel, because that means no Israeli, no Jewish state. But, and here is a very important thing, we assume a shared responsibility, shared responsibility towards the creation of the refugee problem. I'm talking about shared responsibility because I don't think that Israel is the sole one to be blamed for that. The history is quite complex here. But we are responsible and we'll do everything to solve the the refugee problems in other ways. Bring some of them to the, the Palestinian uh, state that will be established. Help getting them citizenship where we're not getting them, Lebanon, Syria, etc. Maybe some will come into Israel. Some will go other places. So though you're not going to get whatever you wished, we assume some responsibility is more symbolic than that. What do we expect of the Palestinians in a re reconciliation, not just mere compromise? Genuine, generous reconciliation. The Palestinians will get parts of Jerusalem. They will get the Temple Mount, Haram el-Sharif. But at the moment when at the negotiations at Camp David that failed, and there are different reasons why they failed. It was horrible for the peace process. When the issue of Haram al-Sharif came up and the Temple Mount, Arafat said, they fabricated their past there. There is nothing there, the Jews. And then Clinton, as a Christian, said, you mean Jesus was not walking in the temple? I mean, he was worried about his own history. <laughs> and I say, at that moment, he lost the Israeli public. Because they say, ah, you mean that when we give this, it means that we're just mere crusaders here, no, no relationship to the land, fabricating conspiratorially the, our connection to the land? That was wrong. What he should have done is the following, talking about reconciliation. He should have said, I'm going to get the, the, the Jerusalem, the Temple Mount. You're going to have excess and you get the, the Western Wall, whatever the solution will be. But I recognize that you have a national religious connection to this land. And I'm going to give it a symbolic expression. This is reconciliation. Why aren't we there? Because we are very much in the business of the blame game. And you look, by the way, at today's negotiations, and you look at both sides, and I would say both sides. You ask yourself, are they negotiating for a solution, or they are negotiating who will be blamed at the end for the failure of the negotiations? So Netanyahu, you say, if you're for a two-state solution, why you continue? Why, what's this big issue of continuing settlements? It's wrong. This is the future state that you want to give the other side. Then you ask the Palestinians, okay, he did a moratorium for 10 months. You said the negotiations will go over for a, uh, for a year. Why did you start the negotiations two weeks before the moratorium ends? For God's sake. Then you ask yourself, Obama and the staff, why didn't you coordinate that? Simple thing. But you wonder, whether these two parties know that they are incapable of paying the price. And there is a price. And the price means you're not going to get what you think you deserve on a just terms. But you're going to get a compromise and reconciliation 
that will really work for the future. And this is our role here, all of us, to stand for the only future that our beloved troubled region has. The only future. And I I, I'm still of the opinion that the good willing forces there are there. And they need the trust and the generosity to make it happen, and such an event could help for that, even if it is 18 hours flight from that place and 10 hours, I think, of jet lag that I suffer from. <laughs> but I, I thank you for listening, and thank you for having us here. Bye. I'd like to make a couple of comments, in, you know, because you mentioned Oslo. Uh, and you're so right, Oslo was so wrong because it did not define the outcome. Whereas right now the efforts being uh, displayed and being invested actually by President Obama and his Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton and uh, by the George Mitchell really are aiming at defining the outcome rather than make the Oslo uh, mistake again. Secondly, on the Oslo, uh, on, the Os on Oslo, you know, I mentioned what um, the Palestinians are doing through the institution building and readying, if you will, the Palestinian state. In effect, I don't know much if you agree with me, but the way I see it is that this is a de facto reversal of Oslo. Oslo left the, you know, the, the end result, in particular ending occupation in the hands of Israel, because it really Israel had to decide it was going to do so. What's happening right now in this new process that's going on, actually it is more of an international community. Burden, responsibility, effort, and led by the United States, obviously. So what you have is, is a very interesting preparation for the solutions through negotiations that would take off from sort of defining the outcome simultaneously there is the actual building of the institutions of a state. That is very essential. That is why this is possibly the most opportune time to push forward for this two-state solution that both Moshe and I, and you, obviously, the organizers, are so keen on having. Um, so secondly, and, and that, that, that brings me to my second point. And again, Moshe spoke of the responsibility of the public. Certainly, the Arab public has a lot of responsibility in supporting the building of institutions, in, uh, Palestinian institutions, rather than supporting Hamas or, uh, 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 or, or you know, in the, the way, particularly in the way Iran is doing, not, not for the interest of coexistence with Israel, not for the solution of the Palestinian issue, but at the expense of, I would even go as far as saying that. So, and then also we need the Israeli public to really get a little bit more, well, to get a little less comfortable, a little more scared. Because really, they really need to worry. And they can, they, it is more of a democracy that they can really influence their government and hold their feet to the fire. I want to see more of Moshe's there saying, no, you don't, and here's what I'm afraid of. And I really want to see more of that loud voice. Uh, but also here in the United States, not only towards you know, how do we support our president and let him know that he can go ahead and pressure the Israelis to stop the settlements because if the, if the result of this, if they don't stop the settlements, we're gonna lose a two-state solution. No, it's okay to say enough. That is not a betrayal of Israel, nor is it, it you know, breaking the, the bond between Israel and the United States. No, it is in the interest of Israel. Because to have that two-state solution, as Moshe said, is in the interest of Israel, not only in the interest of the Palestinians. And I want to emphasize once again the role of the Jewish leadership here and the media here. I honestly think there is more of a debate in Israel than there is in the United States. I think sometimes Jewish leaders think that they're doing Israel a favor by just saying, okay, it doesn't matter, you know, well, our job is only to speak in protection of Israel. Thank God we have some new, small, they're still small, like J Street and others. There are, I, I, at least there is 
more debate. There's a lot of people who are thinking, are we on the same track? Are we doing the right thing? Is it good that we just offer blanket uh, uh, support without saying, you know, that accountability? Because if you want the end result, you want what's good for Israel. And if what this blanket support is leading to what's bad for Israel, then you're really hurting, you know, shooting yourself in the foot. And then finally, uh, I want to say, uh, um, about, a bit, again, you know, when policy is, is somehow it lends itself to further problems. Uh, in, uh, in when Israel withdrew from Gaza, I wish this had happened in a, within a, a, an agreement, within, within a, you know, a peace agreement rather than off we go. And of course, the radicals filled in the, in the, the vacuum. Uh, in South Lebanon, the same thing. There was not a full withdrawal from Lebanese land. And there was little Gajar here, and there is a little Shaba here. And whereas if there has been complete withdrawal, probably there would have been a major undermining of Hezbollah's claim that this is about resistance to free occupied land. I, speaking of Lebanon, I wouldn't really write off this country yet. So let me do, say, I, I, I see your concerns, and I see your worries, and I have, God knows, I have a lot of worries. But if you go to Lebanon, and you see actually what a great fun country it is, despite the difficulties. And don't, don't make no mistake about it, Lebanon will not be run by one faction or one religion or, you know, it, it is about coexistence. And we're learning this the hard way for many, many, many years, but it is doable. I just want you to, not to write it off so fast, because I think the, 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 the zest for life sometimes is what you need in order to make a difference. That's all. Well, first let me start with Lebanon. Ahlan Ustahlan. Thank you. you. Know. <laughs> uh, may, it, may it grow and flourish and, and maybe there is a future. I, I take an issue with you whether Hezbollah's um, um, militia and inside power, you know, supported by the Syrians, the Iranians, is the result of Israel differing about where the 67 line was and five square kilometers in Shaba, we've all, you know, I mean, you might think this way, that way, that couldn't be the reason why Hezbollah has so much power after the war. It was the ammunition, I mean, it was the ammunition. Ammunition, rhetorical ammunition, but you're talking about a strong community that has its own logic and its own mechanism, etc. Et we shouldn't, you're right, we should try to not give ammunition. Exactly. But if we analyze, uh, I think, I mean, you, you might have a, a closer reading of the, of the Lebanese situation. If you analyze the rise of the Hezbollah in Lebanon and its flourishing after the withdrawal, it has, it has its own complex logic, religious, political, ethnic, etc. Uh, and I think, you know, you have um, raised a, a very interesting, two, I think, important issues that make a difference between Oslo and now. First of all, there is the end game here. Uh, second, there is an attempt at state building institutions from the ground that are, seem to be transparent, reliable, powerful, yeah. working for the good of the people led by Salam Fayyad, which is a wonderful thing, wonderful things. But there is something that changed since Oslo, which we have to account for. And here, at least, we're giving each other a list of what each has to do, which is fine. Uh, Hamas dominance now in Gaza and Hamas, by the way, did try some terror attacks as the peace process started. You know, four Israelis killed, two women at, at blank point gun uh, in, a, in a car, Hamas declaring it uh, as their act, you know, in order to undermine the peace, getting their orders from Iran. So what we will have to do is, here's a new reality different from Oslo, because at the time, and we will have to ask ourselves, both of us, 
have to ask ourselves, how do we deal with that reality? Because what will happen if we, it's not going to be today a two-state solution. It could be a three-state solution, mm -hmm. right? It will be, you're going to have the Palestinian Authority and a Palestinian state led by Fayyad and Abu Mazen and etc. with Israel, and then Hamas land in Gaza. It's a new reality, and they will try to do everything they can to stop the process from going. The way, the way there are elements in Israel that will be happy to do that as well. But this is a new fact, which is, we'll have to address. And the main thing I think, which is very important, we're gonna have to start talking each to the other constituency, not to talk to ourselves, because trust is built by directly talking to the other. Uh, one leader that did it, you know, and he melted the Israeli hearts, was King Hussein. You know, he came and, <coughs> King Hussein, right. He came and said, you know, I talk to you. Israelis has not done it enough. We have to, uh, uh, we have, each will have our own lists of things to do, very important. Uh, and then remember all the time that in the end, and that's something I learned in the Middle East, Isra Israelis define Palestinian politics and Palestinians define Israeli politics. That's what will happen. The Palestinian managed twice to transform a government in Israel. One from Peres to Netanyahu, and then one from Barak to Sharon, twice. So we'll have to, and we de define the Palestinian public opinion. And whatever we do, we have to remember that. It's the other party with its fears, with its hopes, with its grievances and suspicions that are looking at each other very carefully. Ragita, would you like to respond at all? Uh, not, not really. Again, not respond in the sense. Uh, it, it, I, I think there was one point that in you know, how much are we that, that three-state solution? Uh, I wanted to say something about it. I don't think that's going to happen because. The situation would be too exacerbated if there is no two-state solution. I think things are going to go worse than that. I mean, I, I am afraid of, God forbid, and, and I hope uh, that you would, uh, I mean, you already had said earlier on that you would be one to oppose it. If there is the option of the so-called one-state solution that Israel might be the one state, meaning the expulsion, the mass expulsion, and then you remember that what Israel had always said in the past, uh, we, you know, Jordan is the alter, Jordan is the uh, is is the Palestinian state. Not, you know, I mean, that is the fears of many Arabs. You know, as you said, we are talking to each other about each other's fears, and that is a very major fear that there will be that mass expulsion, and Israel will say, you know what, this is the one. This is a, this is the Israeli state all the way all the way, mass expulsion of the Palestinians all the way, and Jordan is the alternative Palestinian homeland. That is the fear that is on people's minds, but I don't think there will be a sustainability of a three-state solution. He's talking about Gaza one state, West Bank one state, and Israel one state, right? That's what you meant by three states? Okay. I'll, yeah. I'll explain that. But that's, did I understand you? Yeah, so that's, and I mean, de facto, because you know Hamas is in Gaza and uh, and, uh, and the Palestinians. I, the reason I'm saying that is because Mahmoud Abbas is not going to just hang on while this happens. Because, you know, he will be, he will enter history like the man who allowed that to come along. And that's not going to happen. And I doubt it very much. Sorry, go ahead. The two of you make a very compelling argument. Um, that um, the two-state solution is, you know, I was sitting here feeling optimistic for the first time um, in I don't know how many years, and I saw other people uh, nodding also, but isn't there the, the real question of real politics and real nasty people on both sides, and how can trust and reconciliation control them? 
<laughs> and on your, and your perspective, how do you keep the radicals, as you describe them, the extremists, from defining the nature of the conflict? I, I don't know how I left you optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly am very, very worried about the future of the two-state solution. I actually think it is the most optimistic I have felt so far. I mean, I beg your pardon, the most pessimistic. You left me with the word optimistic in my head. I'm very pessimistic about the future of a two-state solution. Very much so now. Because I thought at the beginning I was optimistic when President Obama just came in and said, you know, we're going to push. But then if we are stuck at just whether a moratorium can be extended or not, then it really is every cause to be very scared. And scared I am. And I think right now it's almost a countdown towards the end of the two-state solution option because of the current situation and if it stays on. I hope that something changes and public opinion rises, but no, I'm not optimistic at all. Uh, I, I, I don't think in these terms, am I optimistic or pessimistic? Uh, I, let, let me put it the following way. When I look at my own people, I see something very deep and not trivial happening, which is more and more Israelis understand that there should be and there has to be a Palestinian state next to them. By the way, this, there is a shift. You know, that includes Olmert and Livni and Sharon to a certain degree, Netanyahu. I mean, these were, these were the, 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 the right of you know, greater Israel plan. Why? Because they understand Israel doesn't have a future as an as a, as a entity with a serious identity as a Jewish democratic state under these conditions. So more and more Israelis uh, understand that there is uh, a need for a two-state solution. You know, I, the first elections I voted in Israel, I voted for a party that stood for two-state solution. It was called Shelley. I don't know if you heard of it. It was in the margins of margins of Israeli politics. You know, I remember because I, at the time I lived in a small village there were two votes for Shelley in the village. <laughs> <laughs> and the gossipers of the village tried to find out who, who did that. And we know one of them, <laughs> the two votes. <laughs> Here I am. And once I told that story, and a guy, the other guy came up, you know, <laughs> 20 years afterwards. Now, Netanyahu says it. OK, you say he says it for public relations, whatever. But that's, there is a shift. There is a shift. But, interestingly enough, with that chip, there is a growing suspicion of the other side for serious reasons that you cannot just push them aside. Serious reasons you have to address. Now, the Palestinians and the Arab world also went through a serious change. You know, the Arab initiative that was mentioned is a breakthrough moment. The Palestinians have come to you know, talk about the two-state solution. This was also, believe me, in the 70s in a neighborhood in Beirut, if there will be a vote, I think there might be only two votes for that. Yeah. True. Yes, well, yeah. so something has happened. And it's not trivial. And I'm talking now about not as a naive dreamer. I'm talking about what you call real politics. That's real politics. The question for us is how to use and make yeah. this reality into something that takes a political shape. That's the challenge. And that means the following. The good people, though they're good, they don't have to be soft. It's fine. And they also sometimes you know, two parties are so entangled that they need a third 
a third party. Not to be their super ego. That's the worst thing. Obama has this slight tendency to posit himself as the super ego of conflicts. You are to blame for that, you are to blame for that. As my mother tells me, and she's far away from my politics, she says, I don't mind giving them Jerusalem, but don't blame me that I started. <laughs> don't blame me that I started. People don't like to be felt guilty and people don't want to be denied of their fears and anxiety, etc., etc. But we need a powerful third party. And by the way, as, as you said, there is a strong, powerful third party, world opinion. Mm -hmm. And it has to mobilize, it has to help. Not to, it's not about twisting arms and it's not about, you cannot twist the arms of the people. Uh, 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 but you have to provide assurances in a serious way to what concerns the people the most. And that can be done. So I, you know, clearly I'm pessimistic. I can tell you all the reasons why to get depressed of the situation. And I've been running Israel in my head already for 22 years at least. And when I meet some other guy who does it, we even form a government. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, but, you know, I, in some ways, I'm, I'm optimistic because this is the only option before something very bad would happen. Yeah. And that's the, that's the source of my, my calling. Oh my God, did you see that? Look at all the questions. Right. Okay, you better hurry up because I have a plane to up. catch. I mean, some of them look like <laughs> statements. Yes. Uh, well, I'll just start with one. Yeah, I'm gonna make, we'll give short answers okay. because I know you have What lots. happens now that the peace process has been temporarily halted. What happens is that we keep pushing. Because again, I think we both agreed that the alternatives are really not pretty. And I think, I, I think, I, I, Moshe would agree with me, I think it's time for uh, public engagement, uh, taking this issue seriously, and pushing forward, and letting the politicians know that we expect of them to go forward and push seriously for a two-state solution. I, no need for me to add. Here, here's a question, it's very interesting. I think you've, you've answered it in your two presentations, but by thinking about it again, it will drive home, I think, the kinds of positions you elaborated. So this question is, what are the principal issues preventing the two-state solution? Is it territory? Is it Jerusalem? Is it political? I think it's not territory. I think the territorial map is clear more or less. It's mistrust. On the Israeli side, it's a fear if we're going to evacuate this land, who would feel it? What it would look like? Would it be a second Gaza? You have to address this issue. The Palestinian side, it's not territory in the simple sense. Settlements is a real problem. Jerusalem, not territory. Jerusalem is a big issue, big issue. And for that, you need a lot of good imagination. Yeah. Uh, you will have to split the city, divide the city, east, uh, west neighborhoods, the capital of Israel, east neighborhoods, the capital of Palestine. The old city, I don't think it can be divided in a, you know, but it should be, as, as I would go for shared sovereignty, shared sovereignty, there will be a peace, maybe uh, the only sacred place that is not, you know, that people can share it mm -hmm. as a sovereign. But uh, Jerusalem will be difficult. But the main thing, the main thing is the establishment of trust uh, and trust means the commitment of both sides to contain their extremes in defining the atmosphere and what's going on, and, uh, uh, and trust of the Palestinians that they will get serious uh, uh, state, you know, 
coherent with integrity, with territorial integrity, and Israelis will get the maximum security they can get under these conditions. Uh, I, I just want to add, I agree on Jerusalem, uh, and I agree in, in practically everything you said, except that I don't think it's only about trust. I think there are really fundamental problems. Uh, the fact that they don't feel pressured, the politicians do not feel pressured enough to deliver, and I think they just could manage this peace process as a process rather than deliver. And that is a very big problem. That peace process went on for so long and everybody benefited and everybody sort of worked it out to, to, to his interest most of the time. And I think it's time to say enough process. We really need results. And I think there is not enough clarity uh, on, on, on the public engagement, and particularly, I think uh, the American public would be really well, uh, will do well if they support the president in, 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 uh, in bringing forward this two state solution. But I think that Jerusalem uh, the solution that you spoke about is the most logical one. Well, there, there are a number of questions that actually deal with the issue of Jerusalem. And we so, it. what? <laughs> and and, and that's, that's interesting. So I want to. I just want to ask one of these questions. Uh, could you describe what might be, as this person writes, a win-win solution for Jerusalem? He just did. He just did. I think I did, but I'd like to repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would say. Look, I would say the following. Here we're talking now about my. Let me. Let me spell out my deepest, I would say, religious convictions. Win-win. You know, Jews and Muslims, they worship the same one God. And we, in our faith, that's what we grew up on and that's what we stand, each in its own way. We witness to the standing before something that transcends us, something that we don't own, which is Allah, Akadosh Baruch Hu, God. And uh, we have to come as these two communities of faith and say, it, it's ridiculous, you know. Think about from God's perspective how it looks. <laughs> I, the this one, is what we call win-win yeah. situation. Yeah, yeah. I, I just the only thing I would uh, want to just also explain, or at least shed light on. I, I think Muslims also, once upon a time, wanted all of Jerusalem for themselves. It is not that Muslims decided that, oh yeah, we want to have only East Jerusalem as a capital of Palestine. So now you have readiness amongst Muslims and Arabs that, who speak of East Jerusalem, half. It's not full as the capital of Palestine. And that is really something we sort of take for granted and we don't think back at the process of arriving at this. And it's, fun, it's, it's, it's quite significant. And I think what Moshe is saying is that each one of us will have to somehow, somehow arrive at a point when that compromise will have to be concluded and, and, and to, uh, to, to see the larger picture. I, I, uh, I respect Moshe's religious, uh, he's, he's much more of a, you know, identifies himself religiously much more than I do, uh, but, you know, because I identify myself as a secular person, but I do understand the value of Jerusalem to all three religions. I mean, I, I, what, what you said, uh, it, it, it touches me quite honestly because I can't imagine that God is happy looking at us killing each other in the name of you know, bowing and kneeling to say, uh, here we are. Um, here's a, another question I, I think that's quite interesting and that is, uh, do the leaderships in both communities fear retribution of their radical constituents? Yes. Sure. Yes. Well, the Prime Minister of Israel was murdered. Yeah. Not a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And it takes courage. I said the Prime Minister of Israel was murdered not a long time ago. Rabin. It's Hak Rabin. And it takes courage. 
and, uh, and, and the radicals say they always threat with the following formula. What do you prefer, a war with the other side or a civil war? Yeah. That's the point. You know, we know civil war is the worst that can happen to a country. But um, some of it is words. And what we have to say, you know, no, no, we're going to, we are not going to let you, by indirect, direct threats of civil war, undermine everything that we dreamed about, which is, from my perspective as an Israeli, the dream of a, a Jewish state that is feasible, that is democratic, that is just. And that will take serious standing, because this is a nuance we hear all the time. You have a bargain from the radicals, you have a bargain. Or go for the war against the other, or go to a civil war, and we'll say, okay, we're going to go to a civil war. Would it be war? No. It won't be a war. It would be tough. It would be tough. But for that you need leadership, you need uh, determination. Uh, Sharon was not deterred in Gaza. Uh, but this is a problem. And leadership will have to take risks. Serious risks. Uh, uh, for that. And it's not easy, there were some leaders who took it, and you need a great, courageous leadership for that. And you need as well, and I'm talking about my own, my own experience at the Oslo, you know, I was a supporter of Rabin and the Oslo Agreement. And uh, I, I had a dinner with him once at the, at the end of the, where at the day he signed the peace agreement with Hussein, King Hussein. He was elated. That was an unambivalent agreement. And I saw the way they guard him. And I said to the security guy, is this the way you guard our prime minister? He said, there is no problem. In, Israel, in Hebrew you say, yeah, besedel, you know. But we will have to remember that the people, who, the good willing people, what I would say, will have to stand with their leadership, will have to protect their leadership in a serious way. This, this idea that you can comfortably observe the situation from, from far, it would not work. It would not work. You need a civic, strong community for that. But there is, you're right, at both, I think, in both sides. Yeah. I think in both sides there is always this implied threat. Either a war with the other or a civil war. You don't have any other choice. Well, we do have other choice. Absolutely. I just, in a nutshell, I think you, you just said it. It's both sides too. And I think, you know, the, that what's going on between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority is an example. I mean, uh, I'm sad to hear that when you saw the late Ishaq Rabin, he was not well guarded. I tell you, uh, Mahmoud Abbas is very well guarded. I see, you know, and I see him walking even in Europe or in, in the States or in any Arab country. There is a lot of threats against his life. Sure. And because he's opting for negotiations, for, you know, that's his strategic choice. And let me tell you, in the Arab world, it's not only about the leaders. There's a lot of people who have been targeted, individuals, just because they said, yes, I want to coexist with Israel. So it's not as, as simple as, you know, it's really, there's a lot of, it's, it's another subject that we will, should talk about some other day, but, but it, yeah, there is a cost and it, courage is, what is needed above all by, polit by the leaders, by the politicians, but believe me, a lot of people have spent their own life sure. uh, defending uh, this, this, this hopefully, hopefully, the coexistence that we seek, but it's not an easy ride. Uh, here is a question which is directed to the two of you, and it says, at what point is a two-state solution impossible given the continuing building of Israeli settlements in the West Bank? Well, I think the failure of uh, right now, the failure of this big push, I mean, listen, in, you have to remember in the region, 
especially in the Arab world, they think the United States is leading this effort. It's, it's the President of the United States, it's the Foreign Se I mean, the S Secretary of State, it is, you know, a senator who's been there for a whole year, and they can't stop them from building settlements, bottom line. And for, from the Arab point of view, that is doomsday for the, uh, for the two-state solution. It's countdown, countdown to, to, to the end of the two-state solution. So I think it is important, very important, that the United States does not look weak, that the United States does not look undermined, that the international community can say, we really need to make sure that you, you hear us out. This is about our national interest as well. And that is why I wouldn't be surprised if there is a move in the Security Council of the United Nations to start with that, you know, the, 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 how does the end look rather than how do we do the process of Oslo and then we'll, look, we'll figure it out later. So that may help. That may help to have a resolution in the Security Council and that is the most peaceful outcome if there is any, you know, real sort of like, you know, that if it stopped and it tracks the two-state solution in negotiations, maybe that will help to push the negotiations forward. Maybe that will bring about the international community to take seriously it, it as its own responsibility to bring about the two-state solution rather than leaving it only to the players, to the regional players, to both Israel and Palestine or Israel and, and, and Syria or Israel and Lebanon. And by the way, we didn't even talk about Israel and Syria. That too is almost a readied, negotiated, over-negotiated uh, uh, sort of an agreement to be signed between Israel and Syria. And I wish that that would be signed because that really would accelerate things forward. And then, you know, we'll stop this playing of, uh, is it the Syrian track, is it the Palestinian track, which comes first? And do we then, when do we do Lebanon? I think, you know, again, uh, once we have a resolution of this conflict, it, it, so many th good things will happen to the region. So many good things will happen to Arabs. So many good things will happen to Israelis. But it is all negotiated. It's all done. All we need is really whatever it takes to make that big push before it's too late. I say, well, uh, that's many things I agree. I want to add to it the following thing. If you look at numbers, you know, and you ask yourself, okay, you can have 70% of the settlers contiguous with Israel with a swap of, of uh, land on a one-to-one -one swap of around 4% of the territories. But what it's important to say, and here is, I, you know, I'm very much against uh, settlement politics. I think it's a huge mistake of us. But one thing is important is to say to the settlements, settlers, and those who settle them, that they're not creating an irreversible reality because there might be an option, and today I'm more and more leaning towards that, that Israel would not have to evacuate each of them, grabbing them from their homes if there will be peace, reasonable peace, good peace. But the country will decide, like the French decided in Algiers, in this and this date we're living, and whoever wants to yeah. come back home will be compensated, uh, uh, settled in a good deal, and that's it. This might be an option. And that what we means is you say, look, you're building a house here, a house there. I mean, it's not massive inflation building. You are not defining the future state of Israel. You're just enlarging the number of Jews in the Palestinian state. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. That also should be, uh, and I think we're coming close to it, you know. Uh, and that might be a point where you would say, okay, uh, uh, this what will happen. Uh, we did in Gaza, we, you know, we, and actually Israel didn't take good care of the settlements it's uprooted in Gaza, uh, 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 but we did it, and that might be, we might go for another solution. That's what the French did. 
And I think it uh, might be a good thing to think about it. Uh, you know, I think we have uh, time for one, uh, one last question. And um, this question really goes to the heart of the question we asked you to think of. Uh, but it's about time. This person writes, what is the ideal timetable? In other words, by when will a two-state solution become the stable condition or go past that so that the situation is irresolvable? Uh, to, if you'd remember when I made my uh, statement uh, in the beginning, I spoke of that one year. One year of a major engagement by the United States as a major party supported by the rest of the quartet members and pushing forward both sides, both, pushing both sides towards reaching the final agreement on a two-state solution uh, and resolve the Palestinian-Israeli issue. The President of the United States spoke. He didn't say, okay, I want this in a year. But when he stands in front of the United Nations Secretary, uh, General Assembly, and he indicates that it, this is what's gonna happen, hopefully, if the two-state solution negotiations went on, that in next year he would stand there and uh, we will be welcoming the state of Palestine as a member of uh, the United Nations, then he is talking about one year. When, uh, uh, when uh, you have uh, Salam Fayyad, the Prime Minister of Palestine, saying it's, uh, what is that expression? Uh, what, did, what is that, the expression he used uh, the, 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 that I quoted him? Uh, because, because, you know, it's sport, it's sports, and I don't understand sports. Home stretch, home stretch, yes. It's, uh, you know, I don't know. It is about four horses, so that's okay, I should know that. <laughs> uh, you know, home stretch to, to freedom, and he is accelerating the work towards the Palestinian state institutions being accomplished, and he says there is one year. We're talking about one year. When you have, you know, the anniversary, by the way, accidentally, this is not even... Uh, on purpose, I'm sure, when the 20th anniversary for the Madrid Peace Conference is also next year, is, is in 2011. Huh? That is also an interesting time frame that we could be thinking about. But that is only if we go on with the negotiations. That is only if we go on with the negotiations. Right now, there are no negotiations. Right now, we're stuck at settlements. The, Ex expansion of settlements or the extension of the moratorium. Therefore, the time frame to, to the negative, pessimistic notion that I have pointed out of the failure of the two-state solution is actually starting now. It's, it's really the countdown had started. But because I don't want to conclude my remarks on this note, and because I do believe that we must rescue the two-state solution, let me say that really if we work hard and if we do something about it and we engage, actually in one year we can have that two-state solution and that will bring about the larger resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict and actually, what a beautiful region it will be. It will not be safe completely because there are radicals on both sides. We have to fasten our seat belts. A lot of people want to jeopardize this potential. So let us not stop at, every, uh, in, uh, at, at, at the whim and or the action of any radical from any of the two camps or more camps than you could imagine. It is not an easy thing to do. There are too many opponents of this. Uh, two-state solution. Some of them are non-state actors, and some are state actors. Some of them, you know, like uh, Iran may not want the two-state solution now because of its own reasons, but some in the Arab world think that Israel, as a state with this government, does not want a two-state solution. So the doubts are there. Trust, again, is, is what Moshe was talking about. But the actions on the ground are not lending themselves to any restoration of confidence in the intent 
to have genuinely bring about a two-state solution. So I hope those who want to jeopardize it are wrong, and I hope that the good forces that want to push forward with this two-state solution are right, because it is better for all of us, including us as Americans worldwide. Let me bring it home to you. A failure of a two-state solution and a development of the other alternatives I spoke about, it is not about something going on over there. Let me bring it home to you. Americans are not comfortable throughout the world right now and feeling that they are you know, that safe because of many reasons. One of them is the, the, the perceived support of Israel, right or wrong. Also, of course, there is a, that battle of, with terrorism. If you know, Al-Qaeda has hijacked the issue of Palestine and went ahead and did whatever it wanted to do with it. If we want to also defeat terrorism, that is trying to jeopardize our national interests and our right, our, our right to, have to feel free throughout the world, we need to take off the table at least half of the problem, whether it is used as ammunition or a pretext. Let us really solve the Palestinian-Israeli issue, the Arab-Israeli conflict, because that is, in fact, in the interests, national interests of the United States of America. Thank you. Just to be very short, because the time is running for this session quicker than the time of the solution of Israeli-Palestinian <laughs> conflict. Uh, so I would say, following much what we said, we have now a very unique combination. You have Fayyad Abu Mazen, the Palestinian side. You have the Arab initiative. You have, in the White House, you have Obama, Clinton, you have Mitchell, who is a very serious person, who has done some serious work negotiating. If we not do it now, I would say in three, four years, we're going to long, long, deeply long for a two-state solution. So this is the time. You know, I, I'm willing to uh, revise my statement earlier of feeling optimistic. <laughs> but, but I will not revise what you have given us uh, in your presentations, and that is at least a sense of hope. And that is really, really important. Thank you both Thank you. for joining us here in Santa Barbara.